we're off. Let's turn, turn. Until last summer, four-year-old Luz de Luna had only known life in a wheelchair. The neurologist from Children's had told us, oh, don't ever expect Luz to walk. And I can't wait <laughs> to go back one day into Children's with the checks and be like, uh, who's not walking now? Now she's using a robotic gait training device called Trexo to teach her leg muscles how to walk. When you see this turn blue, she's initiating the movement. When it says purple, it's the robot doing the movement. And when it's orange, it's resistance from her muscle. CNBC spent a day with Luz and her mom at their home in Los Angeles before coronavirus restrictions were in place. By the time Luz grows up, her mom hopes more advanced mobility solutions, like bipedal robots, will be mainstream, allowing Luz to live life without a wheelchair. You need a ramp for your vehicle, you need a ramp for your home, and it's still with someone else's assistance. The other part is they keep the body just stagnant. I mean, there shouldn't be wheelchairs anymore. We should be done with this, just like we moved on from a lot of other technology that was great, we can do better. In the age of self-driving cars and electric scooters on every corner, we wanted to find out why wheelchairs are still the primary solution for people with mobility challenges, and what innovations could finally disrupt the space, making the world a more accessible place for everyone. A German paraplegic watchmaker invented the first self-propelled wheelchair in 1665. And although materials, design, and features have of course changed, the fundamental concept of solving mobility challenges by putting someone in a chair with wheels has not changed much in hundreds of years. The core job is getting from point A to point B, and they do that really well. And finding a true replacement of a wheelchair is actually a very hard problem to solve. Affordability is a major plus of the wheelchair. Robotic solutions have yet to hit the mainstream because they can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Still, the wheelchair market is expected to reach $4.2 billion by 2026, with the latest Census Bureau data from 2018 finding more than 20 million people in the U.S. who have difficulty walking or climbing stairs. This includes an increasing number of elderly people. The elderly population is the fastest growing population in the world. Mobility challenges continue to increase at an alarming rate, and countries have no choice but to look towards technological solution to solve these problems. Manit Magu co-founded Trexo Robotics, which makes the gait training system for children that's used by Luz. For adults and the elderly, a whole new kind of bipedal robot is being designed by a group at Caltech, led by Aaron Ames. Wheelchairs fill a need. They're inexpensive, relatively speaking. They make sure you never fall. And then you start pushing somebody around and realize how many obstacles there are, that you have to cross the street because the curb's too high there, or the sidewalk there is not smooth enough. And well, you want to get to the other side of the building, what do you do? And all those little things start adding up, and all of a sudden, everything takes more effort and more time and restricts the person more and more. Caltech's Advanced Mechanical Bipedal Experimental Robotics Lab is working to solve this. The science is there to remove wheelchairs from the world altogether. And so the question is, why hasn't it happened? Because it's not easy, it's hard, it's very, very hard. Ames students have adapted a bipedal exoskeleton from French startup Wandercraft to closely mimic walking. So this is a full lower body exoskeleton. It's specifically aimed at restoring mobility for complete paraplegics right now as a starting point. Uh, that is people with no function of their legs whatsoever. It goes fully from sitting to standing, and Ames says it's the first exoskeleton to allow walking without leaning forward on crutches like other models. Then a person can get in it and walk with it dynamically without crutches, meaning their arms are free to move. We have a video that's the first example of a paraplegic walking without the need for crutches walking dynamically, ever. Walking robots are nothing new. During the pandemic, Boston Dynamics even programmed its robot Spot to do autonomous farm work like herding sheep. But getting a walking robot to function with a person inside is a completely different engineering hurdle. Boston Dynamics, I mean, this took them 15 years, hundreds of employees, X amount of money to get to the point where they have these robots doing great things, right? Now you have to take all that knowledge, put it into a little nutshell, and bring it over to restoring mobility. If we're gonna really restore mobility, we have to understand the human system. We have to understand robotic systems, and we have to understand the interface between human and robotic systems. In essence, Ames and his students are calculating algorithms to mimic human walking and then train the robot to respond to a user's motion. And the reality is the world is built for bipedalism. All our structures outside, inside, are built for legs. 
Uh, and so wheels are actually, surprisingly enough, not found in nature. When you're in a wheelchair, you cannot fall, right? But the cost is it limits you to an incredible degree. And so I advocate that with the correct science, you know, we can absolutely get rid of wheels for legs. Legs allow us to remain upright for much of our day, a simple position that has far-reaching benefits. Our whole body is connected. It's an interconnected thing. And if you don't move your legs frequently enough, things go wrong all the way up the chain. And so the ability to move people in natural rhythmic motions has real value. And so that's why things like this exoskeleton has value, even if it's not yet at a point where you can take it home with you and go shopping with it. My other two kiddos are neurotypical kids and I hardly get them sitting for more than 20 minutes. So it's not natural to a kid to be sitting. For growing children like Luz, who uses Magoo's Trexo robot, being upright is especially important. Her weight was great, but she wasn't getting long enough. And with the Trexco, since we've had it, she's had amazing length on her legs. She's able to breathe much better when she's upright. Magoo originally developed Trexo for his nephew, Prenit, who, like Luz, has cerebral palsy. It is the most common physical disability among children, with over 500,000 cases in just the United States. For many kids, like my nephew, it means that they never gain an ability to walk. And watching him take his first steps is still the proudest moment in my life. <laughs> Magoo says there's currently a six-month wait list of families hoping to buy a $30,000 Trexo or lease one for $1,000 a month. In a month, we just saw that, you know, from crying and screaming and being uncomfortable in her body to now just being very content. As people wait for the limited number of upright mobility aids like Trexo, many continue to use wheelchairs every day. And in recent years, there have been advancements in wheeled solutions too. I can have it go forward. It's basically adjusting the center of gravity all the time. Segway's S-Pod was unveiled at CES in January. It's been compared to the hover chairs in WALL-E and Professor Xavier's chair from X-Men. The inspiration was actually really from the Jurassic World, the gyrosphere. Founder Dean Kamen was inspired to start Segway when he saw a man in a wheelchair struggling with balance on a sidewalk. But for now, Segway is not marketing the S-Pod specifically as a solution for people with disabilities. Here we go. Okay, I see. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's... I thought it would be fun for my mom to give this a try. She's in a wheelchair now. And unfortunately, we couldn't make that work because this is still a few years away from being approved as a medical device. Her biggest concern when we were talking about it was that she is in a wheelchair primarily for balance reasons. She wants to not have to worry about falling and she thought that with the wheels, the way they're placed, she might feel like it was going to tip forward. She might feel a bit of a risk to fall. But after using it, I have to say it feels incredibly stable and I'm pretty impressed. And I think that my mom might actually like it as an alternative to her wheelchair. Non-electric chairs have also improved, with some models designed for uses far beyond everyday mobility. Smaller companies than Segway have tried to tackle the limitations of electric chairs. Swiss startup Skuo designs chairs that climb stairs. Ramp is working on a chair with a compact underseat motor, making the usually bulky electric chair portable for solo users. Action Track Chair and Mongo Chairs design custom chairs to go from seated to standing, or to operate on rugged terrain like sand, grass, and even shallow water but these cost upwards of $25,000. The S-Pod will also likely carry a hefty price tag, although Segway wouldn't give a figure. For now, the plan is to sell it to places that can afford it, college campuses and airports, controlled environments where Segway can continue improving the design before touting it as a wheelchair alternative. But the real dream for people like Luz is to have a mobility solution that gets them upright. And for these devices to become mainstream, the price tag needs to come way down, or insurance needs to start covering them. Trex was available for roughly $30,000. Most families cannot afford to buy such a system today, but what we are doing is many families that are buying or leasing this technology today are actually creating the data set that is gonna then, we can use that to go to insurance providers and show them the, the hundreds of thousands of dollars that they can save in the long term and why it makes sense for them to actually make this available for all kids with disabilities. 
WanderCraft says its exoskeletons have been used successfully by more than 40 patients, but only in clinical settings, largely because each device costs 200,000 euros. You can imagine prices lowering on this much like they did for cars, right? The more we build them, the more we can build them quickly and inexpensively while adding features along the way. Then you get to these volumes where you can bring the cost down very, very dramatically. For now, the number of advanced upright mobility solutions being produced is still very low. If you take a look at the exoskeleton field, um, you've got like five to 10 companies and the total number of exoskeletons sold um, annually it's in the hundreds and we really believe that the tipping point is when you are going to have an exoskeleton that people can use on their own in urban settings. To get there, the engineering of bipedal robots like Wandercraft needs to be perfected. In short, there needs to be more funding for research. Why would we not put resources into helping people live better lives? I mean, the number of people we could improve their daily activities. Until you've been around someone or you yourself have experienced mobility issues, you can't quantify how difficult every day is. And Ames says the science being developed to solve mobility could help other industries too. The safety features on these robotic assisted devices can end up in your car and help you not hit another car, not hit a pedestrian on the street. So all these things are connected. So investments in science in general, real science, not pie in the sky, you know, stuff, but the real, the real math under the surface will benefit everyone. Looking the problem square in the eye, Ames says, is what's necessary to make these solutions mainstream for people with disabilities. They often suffer from discrimination, from you know, not feeling like they are part of normal society on a daily basis. And part of, I think, broader society's way of handling it is just kind of when people have those issues, they kind of turn their heads the other way. It's scary for people to even imagine what life would be like not being able to walk. But with enough time and money, those working on mobility solution tech say there is a not-too-distant future where devices like Luz's Trexo and the Wandercraft exoskeleton are part of everyday society. We're at a tipping point. We have the math, we have the science, we have the technology to get exoskeletons and other assisted devices into people's homes in the near term. And if we can get that investment, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. She loves flowers and she loves being out in nature and just being able to feel and be in nature in a position that she's more comfortable in than just sitting and being wheeled around. I never ever thought in a million years that robots would be part of my life, especially not my daily life, and they have become <laughs> that. Okay, we're all done, Lewis. I'm gonna pick you up. Ready? I just see really happiness in her future. And what parent doesn't want that for their kid? That's the ultimate goal, no?